Hello everyone, my name is Benjamin Mekif. I'm a postdoctoral researcher in Professor VJ Anand's lab at the La Jolla Institute for Immunology, and today I'm going to talk to you about our work investigating the single cell transcriptome of SARS-CoV-2 reactive CD4 T cells. I joined the lab approximately one year ago and began investigating the CD4 T cell response to viruses at the single cell level. We're interested in looking at CD4 T cells in the context of viral infection because they act as key orchestrators of the adaptive immune system. They enhance development and memory formation of cytotoxic CD8 T cells and promote class switching in B cells and thus the production of high affinity antibodies. To accomplish all of these different functions, they can differentiate into a number of subsets, but today I'm mainly going to focus on the T follicular helper subset and the cytolytic subset, which I will come back to later. Virus specific CD4 T cells are present in very low frequencies in the circulation and analysis has often been restricted to artificially expanded populations or limited to low resolution techniques. In our lab, we use an assay that enables the enrichment and isolation of virus reactive populations. We incubate white blood cells for six hours with peptide pools and thereafter sort based on expression of surface markers that indicate antigen reactivity. For transcriptomic analysis, we have been using the 10x platform that barcodes individual cells and yields paired gene expression and T cell receptor data sets. Before the COVID-19 pandemic, we were analyzing the CD4 T cell response to some common viruses such as Epstein-Barr virus, cytomegalovirus and influenza. We had screened over 40 healthy donors and selected six with the high responses to further investigate their transcriptome. We had generated a single cell data set with approximately 10,000 virus reactive CD4 T cells and as you can see by this UMAP projection, we get very nice specific clusters. In the top left hand side, we have a CMV specific population and in the bottom left, an influenza specific CD4 T cell population. It was during the process of analyzing and writing a manuscript for this data set that coronavirus infections began to spike and changed our plans. We realized we were in an ideal situation to begin analyzing SARS-CoV-2 specific CD4 T cells and contribute something meaningful to the literature. At the time, single cell papers had begun to appear online, but all had focused on total PBMCs and none had looked at the antigen specific level. We had the technical capabilities in place to not only perform the assays, but also analyze the single cell data. We had collaborators at the University of Southampton who began collecting samples from COVID-19 patients. And we also had our bank of healthy unexposed donors, which we could use to compare the profile of responding CD4 T cells to different viruses. We began sorting cells at the end of April, and in the space of two weeks, we had sorted over 650,000 antigen-reactive CD4 T cells from 45 donors. And following sequencing and extensive quality controls, we obtained a single cell data set with over 130,000 virus-reactive CD4 T cells. This is the UMAP projection of our single cell data set. And as you can see, SARS-CoV-2 reactive CD4 T cells cluster distinctly from other virus. If you imagine the projection is a dinosaur, SARS-CoV-2 specific CD4 T cells are predominantly in the head and in this section further away from the body, whereas influenza reactive cells are present in the main core. The bar plots illustrate that clusters 6, 4, 0, 7, and 12 are highly dominated by SARS-CoV-2 specific CD4 T cells, whereas clusters 1 and 10 are predominantly influenza specific. The donuts on the right show the cluster distribution for each virus, further highlighting that influenza is predominantly in clusters 1 and 10. So we know that the majority of individuals can mount an immune response to influenza, and we can see that the influenza-enriched clusters 1 and 10 have high amounts of transcripts encoding for pro-inflammatory cytokines, and thus display features suggestive of polyfunctional cells which have been associated with protective antiviral immune responses. Notably, however, these were absent from the SARS-CoV-2 and other virus-reactive populations. What we did find was that SARS-CoV-2 reactive CD4 T cells were enriched for T follicular helper cells in the head, and cytotoxic signatures in this section further away from the body. So at a first glance, it appears that CD4 T cells specific for SARS-CoV-2 do not mount a polyfunctional immune response like we see in influenza, but can provide help to B cells, thus helping with anti-production, and are also able to directly kill infected cells. First, I'll talk about the T follicular helper clusters. So TFH cells, as I'll now refer to, are the subset of CD4s that provide help to B cells, which are the antibody producing cells in your body. They provide direct co-stimulation that results in proliferation and production of high affinity antibody through diversification. 
The, the co-stimulatory signals from TFHCD4s can also influence whether a B cell differentiates into a plasma cell that produces large quantities of antibodies, or whether it becomes a long-lived memory B cell. When we looked at the TFH populations clustering in the head based on disease severity comparing hospitalized and non-hospitalized patients, we noticed big differences between clusters 0 and 6. Cluster 6 appears to be dominated by cells from hospitalized individuals, whereas cluster 0 is predominantly made up of cells from non-hospitalized individuals. If we look at the frequency of T follicular helper cells in the total CD4 population, we do not see much of a difference between the two cohorts. However, when we break it down and look at frequencies of individual clusters within the total TFH population, we see that hospitalized patients have high frequencies of T follicular helper cells in cluster 6, whereas non-hospitalized patients have higher frequencies of TFH in cluster 0. Looking at the transcriptome in more detail, we notice that cluster 6, cluster 6 expressed high levels of transcripts encoding for cytotoxic proteins, as shown here by the co-expression of perforin and granzyme B, but also high levels of transcripts encoding inhibitory, inhibitory cell surface molecules and proteins linked to poor immune function. In addition to CD4 T cell data, we also had antibody titers from each donor. And as you can see, when we look at the total frequency of TFH in relation to antibody concentration, the higher the frequency of this subset, the higher the concentration of antibodies in the circulation. However, if we once again split clusters 6 and 0, we can see that actually a high frequency of TFH in cluster 6 negatively correlates with antibody concentration, whereas for cluster 0, a high proportion correlates with higher antibody concentration. So not only do we see the unconventional profile of these T follicular helper CD4s at the transcriptomic level, but moreover, we can link this apparent dysfunction to the production of antibodies directed against elements of SARS-CoV-2. Finally, I'm going to talk to you about the cytotoxic population that we found in our data set. Compared to TFH, CD4 CTLs are relatively understudies, as until recently they were thought to be an artifact of in vitro culture, and because they are largely absent in healthy donors. As a result, little is known about the mechanisms that govern development and maintenance. Short-lived CD4 CTL populations have been found in acute infections, along with long-lived populations in chronic infections that may arise from repeated antigen exposure. They have been shown to play protective and pathogenic roles in viral infection, and the study to date has solely focused on the expression of cytotoxic proteins. Clusters 4 and 8 are where we saw a strong cytotoxic signature, and we found that these were increased in hospitalized patients. They were characterized by high expression of transcripts encoding for cytotoxic proteins, but interestingly we found that this population was also characterized by high expression of transcripts encoding for chemokines that will recruit other immune cells. This suggests that not only do they have the ability to lyse infected cells, but also act as key recruiters of immune cells to the site of inflammation. Furthermore, both these clusters were highly clonally expanded but we do not know yet know whether this has a positive outcome on resolving infection or whether it contributes to the pathological inflammation in patients with COVID-19. So from this talk, I hope I've been able to show you that using short-term stimulation assays is an efficient way of isolating antigen-reactive CD4 T cells, and that from this anal the analysis of our single-cell data set, we identified two populations that shed new light onto the immune landscape in hospitalized COVID-19 patients a population of cells that do not efficiently help with antibody production, and another that may drive the pathological inflammation of the disease. With that, I'd like to thank everyone who contributed to this project, getting it written and submitted for peer review in six weeks, and that goes mainly for Siren Vicente for the bioinformatics analysis, Anthony for help with some of the sorts, and Haley for preparing the libraries, and I'm happy to take any questions.